Good afternoon, my name is Hilary Cass. I'm Chair of the British Academy of Childhood Disability. I'm here with my two friends and colleagues, um, Steph Nimmo, who is both a writer and also a bereaved parent. And Daisy died... And she died in January 2017, so we've just had her second anniversary. Okay. Um, and I also have with me Sarah Barkley, who is Director of the Medical Mediation Foundation and also a former journalist. So, um, we're here today to talk about the editorial, the annual BACD Chair uh, editorial, uh, which I wrote in the run-up to our conference. And one of the things that we're seeing in terms of the changing face of disability is the double-edged sword of the fact that although we're making many advances and children are surviving for much longer, that's also leading us into some quite complex and difficult um, ethical uh, dilemmas. Um, and that means that that's also sadly leading us into conflict between clinicians and parents and families. So the focus of the editorial is really to think about how those decisions are made both by clinicians and by parents and how there can be such a radical difference in the way in which they approach these. Steph, you made the very difficult decision at a point in time mm -hmm. that um, you were going to go down a palliative pathway uh, with Daisy when mm -hmm. you felt that um, uh, prolonging her life was no longer in her best interest. Would you be able to talk a little bit about how you arrived at that decision? It's actually quite a long decision. Daisy died at the age of 12, um, but she was born very prematurely and she, she received a, an early diagnosis within the neonatal unit of a very rare genetic disease that was ultimately life limiting. And so we knew from the get-go that Daisy was not going to live to adulthood. And in many ways that allowed us a chance to get our heads around that. Um, we also had a very good neonatologist who referred us very early on to for hospice support. Um, so that was in many ways our early experience of um, palliative care in the community. Um, so I think th those are quite crucial. We, we accepted, it was hard, we accepted very, very early on that our child was not going to be with us forever. Um, that didn't mean we weren't going to pursue courses of treatment while they were still viable um, to, to prolong her life for however long she was with us. Um, and also early, um, early referral to palliative services within the community through hospices meant that we built up very good relationships with the teams there. Um, as Daisy grew older, um, she, she developed complete intestinal failure and became TPN dependent. And, and then things really started to fall apart with her. Um, so, you know, the, the TPN eventually ended up being 24-7. She couldn't take any drugs enterally, so everything had to be via infusion. Um, she developed uh, multifocal epilepsy that was very, very difficult to control. And it was then really, really clear that we were in the downward trajectory that we'd always anticipated. And I think, as is very common with children with really complex needs and rare syndromes, there's no obvious end point. Um, but we were referred um, to the hospital palliative care services. And for my husband and I, it was very much couched in the terms of it being um, symptom management, which was a real positive for us. So it wasn't because I couldn't, in my mind, see that she was at death's door. Mm. She, was, she had quality of life. She was able to go to school. Um, she was able to do the things that she wanted to do. But clearly, on a long-term basis, that wasn't viable. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for talking so openly yes. about that, Steph. So, Sarah, this was, you know, fortunately, um, a situation in which the doctors mm -hmm. and Steph were in complete alignment, and, and, mm -hmm. and I hope that that's a, a majority of cases, mm -hmm. but of course the cases that you're involved are not like that, that you often get called in when there has been a, a, a major disagreement that's got into a significant conflict. Um, so to go back to my point about doctors have that feeling that they must be right because they're working in their ethical framework, they've 
read the ethical guidance and 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 you know they they're bolstered by that. And parents are actually making their decision based on a love of that child that the clinician can't begin to um, uh, understand, and the the, the 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 experience of so many years of that child coming back, coming back. How do you bridge? How do you begin to bridge that kind of gap? It, it often feels like walking into an emotional war zone when you when you, you go into those rooms and you see a clinical team on one side and parents on the other side who are not not able to to agree. Um, and and you can feel the pain of that when you you walk into the room. And my question is always what, what what made a really difficult, complex situation, and it doesn't get more complex than the kind of situation Steph has described, what might turn that into a conflict and a breakdown of relationships between a, a family and a clinical team or between parents and, and the clinical team? And and I think sometimes, often, actually, it's, a, it's around how the conversations have gone. It's about communication and how that's evolved o over time between the parents. And parents often say to me, they're not listening to me, they're not, they're not hearing what it is I'm trying to say about my child. And from my experience, conflicts often arise when the parents feel that the, the communication and what they're being told by the clinical team doesn't really feel as if it's about their child and the story of their child, it's about statistics, it's about what other children with this condition, how they might behave, what might happen to them. And I think sometimes clinicians do that with the best of intentions, but often the impact on parents is to say, but it's my child we're talking about, and my child hasn't done this, my child does things differently. And I think when it feels that there's a bit of a mismatch between the stories that the parents are telling and the information that the clinicians are giving is where conflicts start to arise. And what I try to do when I mediate, and of course sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, is to try and bridge that gap by trying to help a conversation happen in which all those voices can be heard in all their complexities and where you try and get people, everybody, to a position where they're willing to hear what those perspectives are. And when you, that's where you try and bridge the gap. So you're not quite saying step into my shoes and see things from my world, um, but what you're trying to do is to be able to help those conversations which have become really difficult to take place in a way where everybody feels supported and where they feel that their perspective is valid and it's their truth. Atul Gwanda, he's a wonderful writer and surgeon, sums that up very well when he talks about health professionals feeling comfortable with the stuff they can fix mm. and much less comfortable with the unfixable mm. stuff. And when we're talking about uh, situations where there is no cure, where there are no, you know, in quotes, happy endings, where there's a lot of emotion involved, which is exactly what you were trying to, to tease out here, that's the unfixable mm. stuff. And, and often clinicians feel much uh, less comfortable working with that <coughs> because it requires them to respond to emotion mm. and that's not necessarily the territory that they've been trained mm. and I don't want to, to generalize too much either because there are many many clinicians who do this stuff brilliantly um, and uh, but they often don't have much training in, in, in how to mm. do it they learn you know they often say we've learned the hard <coughs> way you know in the, we've had conversations which we wish we'd never had and we've learned the hard way to have them better um, so I think often there's quite a lot that can be done to help build clinicians' confidence and skills in having probably the most difficult conversations that they ever have with parents like Steph who yeah. are trying to make a decision about do I stop intensive treatment from my child? I mean, it doesn't get more difficult than that. Thank you.